So are you going to start clapping for a nice big warm welcome to the stage? Oriel Mazumna! Hello. Right, I'm not going to tell any jokes. Thank you. Thank you, Saul, for waving. Um, what I'm going to do right now is just go and grab a little glass of Prosecco to wet my whistle just in case. So bear with, with me one minute. Oh, look, what a gent. Thank you, Ollie. Thank you. Um, so I may need this later on. I'm not going to put it by the speaker. Okay, so my mic skills are maybe not what Ollie's are. Can you hear me okay? Right. Um, I'm not going to hold it because I'm not going to do stand-up. I'm going to just tell you some stuff. So, uh, have I got everybody at the back? So, please do not expect... Oh, this is nice. You're very responsive and, and real. Um, I'm going to talk about some stuff that I think it is going to basically be... Let me check the time. So, we're coming up for 10 past, so it's going to be about 20, if you're unlucky, maybe 30 minutes of the world, according to me. Um, I warn you that I can speak for England, but luckily I've got very short notes on a very small piece of paper, so I won't go over. I'm not going to improvise too much. Um, so let me tell you a little bit about me uh, and my credentials, such as they are. They're a bit feeble, but my credentials for standing up in front of you and sharing anything. Um, one is I do like to tell stories, and I'm not at all embarrassed about the stories I've got from my own experience, uh, lots of the, the mistakes I've made along the way. Thank you. And, oh, hello. Can you hear me even better now? Great, marvellous. Um, let me put my name up there. So my name's Oriel Majumda. I'm, um, I'm from Rotherham, actually, and I've lived in Sheffield since the 80s and then went away off to London, did that thing that people do uh, where you go to London to see if the streets are, gold, uh, streets are paved with gold, which they were for a bit, actually. And then I had my oldest, 99, and I came back um, because when it was all rootsy and lovely down there, you know, in, when you've got a little baby in a pram, finding needles in your kind of front stairwell is not so groovy. Um, so I came back to be near my mum and dad, like you do, and uh, been here ever since, and I bloody love it. love Sheffield. Um, and I feel like a daughter of Sheffield. So what I do for a living... Um, is I coach and I talk about coaching and I teach coaching and, I, and I'm obsessed with it. I absolutely love it and I feel it was a late career move for me. So I changed career at, at 49 um, and I've been doing it for the last 10 years so I'm going to turn 60 uh, later this year so I'll talk about that a bit. But what I want to do is talk about some of the stuff that I see people struggling with, grappling with, thinking their way through some of the things I've been working through and just share some of the kind of ideas or learning that I've got. So I am no expert, let me warn you. I want to start by asking you a question um, and if you want to answer it um, by waggling your hand in the air, feel free to do it. Um, so we've been through the most extraordinary... T it's funny how time lags, isn't it? Because I'm saying two years and I think it's probably longer than two years now, isn't it? It's more like two and a half. Um, and I know that we've all had strange and varied experiences. So who had a good pandemic or goodish? Anybody have a goodish? Yeah, a few. Um, anybody have a completely shit pandemic? Yeah. Um, anybody have good and bad in parts? Yeah, lots. Yeah, and me too. So I'm going to talk about... Um, so what happened to me when the pandemic started was... I got a call, I've been working with a big charity who do um, food redistribution. So they take surplus food and they redistribute it. And um, if you watch the telly and see a certain supermarket's adverts, you will know who I'm talking about because uh, they sponsored them through the pandemic. So the lockdown happened and I'd been an a very bad, let me tell you, a very bad academic at Sheffield Hallam teaching a master's in coaching and mentoring that I'd done 10 years earlier. And um, I got sick of it because I'm such a rubbish academic. And I'd, in a fit of temper, I'd handed my notice in. And unfortunately, or fortunately for me, my notice period came up just as we went into lockdown. So all my stuff from Hallam is still in the office back there. I mean, you know, this is bizarre. Anyway, I kind of wrote it off. Um, and what happened for me was this, this charity rang me up and said, uh, we really 
which I just blessed the day they did it. We want you to do some sort of like rapid response coaching to be on the end of the phone for all these people who are now working 20 hour days trying to get all this surplus food out to food banks to support people in communities who can't eat. And so what happened was suddenly I'd gone from doing a lot of teaching and a bit, a bit of coaching but not too much to just doing 10, maybe you know, eight, 10 hours a day talking to people as they went through their pandemic experience while I was going through my own. So I'll explain my home setup. Um, so we haven't got a very big house. It's a really nice house, but it's tiny um, in, in uh, Salt Lane. Where else would I live? That's 11, obviously, like, you know, have a look at me. So I'm in my little nice house. Um, my gorgeous husband, who's a nightmare, was sat downstairs doing his spreadsheet. So he's downstairs. I'm up in the spare room, sat on a tiny little spare room bed uh, with, you know, you know the deal if you haven't got a proper office at home, books piled up. And I'm like, the world is coming into me through my, through my computer screen. And I'm getting to experience what it's like for all these people all over the world, actually. I started to work with um, humanitarian leaders in Africa, in America, um, some in Russia, which is like now that's interesting. Um, so I was really blessed with bit, like a window into people's experiences while I was also having my own. Uh, my oldest kid is in Manchester, he's a musician. Of course, all the gigs finished overnight. So that, um, you know, that kind of cut his income off. So I was worried to hell about him. My youngest daughter, my youngest who's a daughter was going through GCSEs and then A-levels, um, basically lost the plot with that and um, is doing something completely different now. So I was dealing with my own stuff as well. Anyway, the reason I'm telling you this is because what I'm going to talk to you about is based on that. So I hope it's not too heavy. I didn't, I kind of maybe misjudged this going on first. Maybe it should have been more lulls, but I'll try and lighten it up along the way. So the number one thing that everybody talks about, so bear in mind, I'm talking to people in warehouses in Stockport trying to get batch loads out to food banks. I'm also talking to people in Botswana who are running a country office for a humanitarian agency. I'm talking to the Arts Council, I'm talking to this, that and the other. And to a person, they're telling me the same things over and over again. So I start to think, hang on, there's something universal going on here and thinking about my own experience. So my, um, let me tell you a little bit about myself. So now I don't, I don't give a fuck, actually. So I can stand up in front of you, you can judge me, I don't care think what you want about me I'll just be who I am um, it's taken me a lot to get there so I've gone through being very obedient very compliant very dutiful um, trying to do always do the right thing trying to um, make people like me so I'm thinking well hang on a lot of this that I'm hearing from all these people is like the stuff that that I felt what's going on so I started to try and distill it a bit into um, I want to say grandly some universal truths, but that sounds really wanky, so I'm not going to say that. Um, into some things that I think might be helpful, and I've, and I've turned my hand in, in the pandemic, which was, which was fun actually, to doing webinars for people, to just help them think through what, how they want to deal with this stuff that's coming at them. So I'm not in the business of telling anybody what to do, but I'm really good at listening and helping people work it out for themselves, which I think is a skill, you know, it's a skill to, um, to, to have the bravery and the courage to work this stuff out for yourself and to be bold and, and take steps that nobody else has taken or that maybe you, you people around you don't think is a good idea. So what I'm going to talk about, and I hope is inter interesting at the least, but you might find some of it helpful or it might resonate with you, is some of the stuff that I've found out. And I'll, um, I'm not going to tell any... I might tell client stories, but not in a way that you can um, that you could identify them because obviously... Well, for me, it's obvious that confidentiality is really important. But, but some of the stories are so phenomenal that I feel I have to share them. And then a lot of them are mine, and I'm free to tell you those. So, are you with me? Don't, don't, don't drift off. Well, you can drift off. I don't mind. Just, just look engaged. So, I feel okay. Okay. So Sean will be back with the jokes later, if you can be patient. So, so I guess the question that I'm, that I'm thinking about for this is life is difficult, how do we get through it? Like how do people get through difficult times? We've got 
I really don't want to bring the tone down that much, but we've got some difficult times coming, coming down the line. If you look at the, um, the heat temperature graph for India, it's like over 60. People are frying. Like we're, you know, we're heading for 40 in the next few years. Things are, things are going to get tough. The cost of living crisis, you know, we've come out for a nice fun evening and I'm reminding you about all this stuff. But we know that life is a lot harder for some people who aren't maybe in this room. So how do you get through it? So I've got some, some ideas about that that I'm going to share. I'm, um, I do like a bit of Greek philosophy on the side and I'm with Socrates and Socrates says, an unexamined life is not worth living. And I, I think the same. I think if, we, if, we're, if we're having these lives, by the time you get to 60, you look back and you realise more of your life's behind you than it is in front of you. And I think what, I'm quite a basic person. I think, what's the point of having all this stuff, having all this ex life experience, if we don't reflect on it and make stuff of it and, and make choices of, as a result of what we've learned? I'm all about learning. So yeah, let's examine let's examine my life and some other people's, um, hopefully in a semi-light-hearted way. So, um, and you can take or leave this, obviously. So some of this might resonate, some of it might think it's bullshit, and that is fine. You're allowed. So the number one thing I notice, and I hate the term so much, but I'm going to use it because you'll all recognise it, um, especially. No, I'm not even going to say that. I was going to say, especially if you're a woman, but I think it applies universally, is imposter syndrome. The dreaded imposter syndrome. So whether you're running a country office in wherever I said, Rwanda or wherever I said, Botswana, or you're, um, you know, you're driving a forklift, everybody feels like they are going to get found out. And I guarantee you, every single person, like some of you might be a bit more ballsy in the room and go, I don't. What's she on about? I don't. And amazing if you've worked through that. But um, I do, and lots of other people do. I think from observation, the universal condition, like the human condition, is full of doubt. There's a brilliant piece of writing by um, a Dutch guy who writes about coaching. He's brilliant. And he says, um, if you don't doubt, you're not doing it properly. So if you're not experiencing doubt, like what you're playing at, like why aren't you thinking about things and doubting? So, so people are, are feeling this stuff. They're feeling like they're going to get exposed, like they're not good enough for do, to do stuff, like who am I to do this, this thing that I'm trying to do? And that, uh, that applies whether you're my kid trying to make music or, um, I don't know, you're heading up some big organisation and have a massive budget at your disposal. It seems to me absolutely um, at the heart of people, as well as trying really hard, like wanting to do the right thing, which I see in everybody, we also suffer extreme doubt about it. So I'm going to hopefully try and shed a little bit of light because I've got to say, although I have doubt, it doesn't bother me anymore. I can know what to do with it. It's, it's, um, it's, it's, a, it's a familiar foe. You know when you get to know your enemies and you know their moves, if anybody doesn't like video games and stuff, you get to know the little signature moves and you can kind of outwit it. So I think of imposter syndrome, or I prefer the word doubt, I think of doubt like that, like, I see you coming, mate. I know, I know what to do with you. Um, and, and clue, none of these are about toughing it out. Not one of the things I'm going to talk to you about is about being strong. I don't believe in it. I think be as weak as you, you can possibly be. Um, the artist, uh, Jenny Holzer, has, she does text art, and she has a brilliant um, little piece of text art, and it says, turn soft and lovely any time you have a chance. And that's my mantra. Like any time you have an opportunity, go soft and lovely, go vulnerable, go porous, like bloody absorb life. And I've been doing that maybe when I got brave, I started doing it. And um, I've been having a ball. Let me t you know, catch me and have a drink with me. I'll tell you about the fun I'm having. But that like, just don't try and tough it out. Try and be weak in the face of it. So, so let's as as assume, unless you're really quite exceptional, we're all living with doubt and imposter syndrome and fear it, fearing we're going to get caught out. What can you do about it? So I feel like I've successfully brought the tempo and the, the tone down so everybody... And they tell me I've got quite a relaxing voice, so hopefully you'll feel really zen after this uh, or really bored and switch off. You, you can't please everybody. Um, so my number one question, and these are questions I've asked myself, I ask myself, why are you staying small? Why are you staying small? Why are you diminishing yourself? 
if you tell yourself, who am I to do this, what you're effectively doing is being tiny in the face of all this other stuff. I once asked a woman, um, I said, what's it like? She was telling me about feeling bullied by her boss. And I said, what's it like to feel bullied? Like, how big are you and how big's that boss? And she said, I'm a molecule. I mean, seriously, imagine what it feels like to be a molecule. I mean, that's like a speck. Well, I, I'm not a scientist. I don't know how big it is, but it's tiny, right? You can't even see it, can you? And, and I said to her, because I do creative coaching, so I said to her, what does, um, what does a molecule sound like? And she went, it's like this. I was like, oh my God. And as soon as she said it, you could see her going, bloody hell, like that is no good, is it? And I said, well, okay, what, how do you want to talk? And she said, I just want to talk like this, like I'm talking to you. I want my boss to be the same size as me and I want us to be able to have a conversation. And it did something to her as soon as she could say that. But that, but this, so why do people stay small? Why did I stay small for so many years? I never said boo to a goose. I wouldn't have stood up and said this. I'd have been always second guessing what people thought of me. More on that later. So stay, how are we doing for time? Oof. So staying small, I never, I'm only on one, how am I going to get to six? I'll have to whiz through them. So staying small is no good, but why we do it is because it keeps us safe. So back to being vulnerable. We stay small because if you keep your head under the radar, nobody's going to come and get you. That big vulture that you think is circling is not going to swoop down and pick you up. I don't even know if vultures do that. Is it eagles? Anyway, whatever bird of prey is going to... So that's why we do it. So when you, when you feel yourself diminishing yourself and backing off and going into the shadows because you doubt yourself, what you need to do, in my humble opinion, is feel bright, like summon up your courage and be the size. Don't be a molecule. That's my learning from that. I feel like I must speed up. So the reason we stay small, A, it keeps us safe. We never have to take a risk. We never have to try it. We, ne you know, we never have to get it wrong. So that, so that makes good sense. Like, okay, well, our brains are clever. They keep us safe. The other reason we do it is because we fear that other people, in our worst fears, and people tell me this when I'm working with them, our kind of worst human fear is that people are going to point and laugh. My worst fantasy, if I entertained it, would you, you would all start talking to each other and chatting and turn your backs on me. But hey, you're all polite people. Most people are polite. Most, I've never seen a work situation. I've been working 40 years, nearly 40 years. Nobody ever points and laughs. The worst that happens is they talk behind your back. Who gives a crap if they're talking behind your back? So, so the judgment of others, and this is, this is the big thing I've learned, is our projection into blank spaces. That's what's going on. People smile like you're just kind of looking and being nice. If I was feeling wobbly and not sure of myself, but, you know, I'm a cocky sod, I don't care. I don't care now. What I would be doing is seeing blank faces and going, oh, my God, they hate me. This is crap. Oh, what am I going to do? They're all judging me. Half of, half of our fear of, well, two-thirds of our fear of judgment is our own projection of our worst fears about ourselves. You do not have to do that. You can catch yourself and not project, you can go, that is a fantasy, that is my own worst fear that I'm putting in their mouths. They are not saying that. What, and I'm guessing here, apart from, I mean, there'll be one or two in the audience who go, this is shit, I don't like it, I don't like the way she's talking, and that, you know, in a group this size, that'll happen. Most people are going, God love her, she's trying, that's not, well, you know, it's not my cup of tea, but it's all right, isn't it? And, you know, she'll be finished in a minute. Most people are benignly thinking sort of half-decent thoughts about you, and most people don't give a crap because they're going, what time is the car, you know, what time's my ticket run out, and uh, I hope the babysitter's all right, and can I go over and get another beer before they all go, and most people are just absorbed in their own stuff, so nobody cares, like genuinely nobody cares. I'm going to speed up. So yeah, so forget about the judgment of others because you're usually making it up yourself. Think about where you're putting your attention. A lot of people fritter, include, um, these are all things I do, fritter their attention on things where they have absolutely zero chance of having any influence at all. So you, you um, and I don't mean that you should be disinterested in things like what's happening in Russia or um, the climate emergency or all these really important world things. But put your attention where it's going to count. Are you going to go and protest? Are you going to sign an online petition? Are you going to make a change in your own life? 
This is, if you're interested, and you probably know this, is from the work of Stephen Covey, and he talks about spheres of influence, spheres of control, and spheres of concern. Spheres of concern is all the shit in the world that we could be worried about. And if you put all your attention into the sphere of concern and none into what you can actually do, you will drive yourselves nuts. So please don't do it. Whenever you think about, when, you know, maybe you'll think, I'll give you the perfect example after I've had a sip of drink. Hang on. I'm just going to hold it so then it, I'll get even more sweary. Thank you, Chris. Um, sorry, it's mild swearing. I did check with Becca that mild swearing would be okay. Uh, you should hear me later on. Anyway, um, so where was I? Yes, yeah, so when, I'll give you an example from lockdown. My son, uh, who I adore, never brushes his teeth. He's 22 now. Uh, I suspect he never, still never brushes his teeth. I'm paying his dentist fees. In, in the pandemic, it became my obsessive concern that he, he over in Manchester, and we couldn't go and see him, would be brushing his teeth. That was my biggest thing, is Evan brushing his teeth. Crazy, craziness, like, you know, some of us, me, I lost my marbles in that early lockdown, even though I loved it and it was peaceful and, the, you know, the birds were singing. There were some things that just kind of, like, freaked me out. I've also lost huge chunks of it, which I think might be a trauma thing. Like, I can't remember any of it. I don't know about you, but I've just gone blank about all of it. Um, anyway, so where was I? Yes, with the teeth. So... And then I was thinking, I'm teaching this stuff about spheres of influence and spheres of control. What are you playing at, Oriel? Like, why are you worrying obsessively about his teeth when you can do zero about it, short of going over there and holding his bloody toothbrush? So, you know, which you cannot do. So, obviously, because there are boundaries and he's a grown man. And I'm not an overbearing mother, honestly. So, so that taught me a lesson. And I thought, put this stuff into practice. And the poor lad, I now tell that story to everybody I come across when I'm talking about this stuff. So, um, and so you better be bloody paid. But, but I pay for it, you know, so some of it, maybe I need to stop paying for it. Anyway, thank you for the therapy session with that. So, yeah, think about where you're putting your, your attention. Um, I'm coming towards the end, you'll be thankful to hear, possibly. Here's one. Comparison is the thief of joy. If you are on Insta, like I am, almost constantly, or um, I'm looking at other coaches going, well, they seem to be doing very well, or, you know, all the comparisons we make, you will feel rubbish. You will feel terrible because comparing yourself to other people makes you feel terrible. It does not inspire you. It does not, this is my opinion, the world according to me, remember, uh, take it or leave it. Um, it doesn't inspire me, it doesn't make me feel great, it doesn't drive me on to better things, it makes me feel worthless and stupid. So I don't do it now. I follow Instagram accounts with cats and poetry and food and mindless celebrities and Trini Woodall being the silly posh cow and that's what I do. Excuse me Trini, don't, yeah, I'm on camera. So, like she's watching, watching the content. Anyway, so... Be really thoughtful about what you're doing with your comparison. This is your attention. This is your precious resource of your attention and your intellect and your heart and your soul. Do not squander it. Put it where you want. I mean, look at stupid accounts like I do. Don't spend it on, on worthless comparison that does not aid you to do what you want to do. That's, I'm getting very, look, I'm getting all didactic now, I'm telling you. So I'm going to have a little drink. Hang on. So, we're on number five, right? We're building up to a big crescendo of number six. So, number five is lower your standards. Just be crap. Just relax. I'll, I'll let you into a tip, a, a little bit of my own experience. So, um, I used to try so hard for pe to get people to like me, to be good at my job. I wanted people to go, she's, oh, she's good at her job, isn't she? Whoa. Until I got to 50, what happens to uh, anybody who's reaching the menopause? Your estrogen goes, you stop giving a crap. It's, it's honestly, I know people fear it, but it's pretty marvellous. It's just great, because then you can be queenly. You can rise like a queen after the suds of your previous life. It's amazing. Um, so I stopped giving a crap, and then I was just, and I got a bit tired and a bit lazy and a bit like, I don't want to do this so hard. So I stopped trying to please anybody, please myself, and everybody goes, oh, Oriel, you're so awesome. Like, geez, if I knew that, like, 
why, why, why was I trying so hard when all it takes is to be absolutely purely yourself? I know it's, you know, like your mum used to say, just be yourself, darling. Well, bad news, mum's all right. But, you know, but learning to get, so it took me 50 years to work that out, but mums are always right. So maybe I'm right about the teeth, though. So you've got to, so you've got to, if you have a perfectionist streak like I've got, um, where you want everything to be good, you want to be excellent, you want to be not necessarily the best, but you want to be awesome all the time. It is a hiding to nothing. It, what, you, what you're creating is a monkey for your back. So you have just got to lower your standards and do what you can do with what you've got. You just have to just kind of coast through and do, do what you can. And I think for the pandemic, actually, it did teach us you know, for those of us who are, um, like I try and, you know, I was trying to control things and get life to be like I wanted it. And then this huge thing came out of nowhere and we couldn't do that. It was a massive lesson for me in just flowing, just flowing with the river, seeing what happened. Um, and, and things got better. Actually, what happens then, if you lower your standards and stop trying so damn hard, is your natural talent, your natural mastery of what, what it is you can do, comes to the fore you will go into flow because you've, you've got more brain capacity I mean this sounds like it's not science but it actually is um, you will have more brain capacity to be good at the stuff that you want to do if you let go of some of those inner voices um, and there's a whole other thing I can tell you about inner voices but inner voices that say you're not doing it right do it better Ugh. you know and those voices can be our parents school teachers all those people who tell us as we're growing up that we're not good enough so, low standard. Um, and then I want to, um, to talk about tall buildings. This is where I'm going to finish, and then I'm going to read a tiny little poem. So, um, not of mine. I, I do write poetry, but it's, uh, it's a bit rubbish, because so, I've lowered my standards. Anyway, um, tall buildings. You know those skyscrapers in New York or Chicago, all those places, are built with sway in them. If you look at them, they go like this. That is so, when a strong wind comes, they don't, if they were rigid, a strong, you can tell, I'm quite scientific in this stuff, a strong wind would come, they'd be brittle, they'd fall over, or the top would break off. That's what happens. They're built with flex, so that when strong winds come, they can go with the wind and stay standing. So you get my metaphor, hopefully I don't have to labor it, that be like a tall building. You just sway, when it comes, you accommodate, you, um, you go turn soft and lovely, like, like Jenny Holzer says. You go soft and lovely if you get a chance. You relax into it. You go, uh, if you believe in a deity, you say, like, take care of me, whatever you believe in. Look after me. Maybe it's the universe. Maybe it's God. Take, take me with you and let me see where I wash up with this stuff. And that is, it, and from what I can see of all these people I'm, I'm working with and myself, that is... By far, if you can relax into it, if you can surrender to it, I guess this is like Buddhism, right? But I, I've, I've not read Buddhism, so I don't know. So, so that kind of stop being strong. We are culturally um, programmed to think strong is good. What am I doing? Oh, I'm okay. So st that strong is good. I think strong is rubbish. Be strong. Who cares? Like, why be strong? What, what does strong do? Like, why is why is emotion weakness? Why is um, flexibility weakness? Why is um, knowing when to quit weakness? Those, to me, seem the most intelligent things we can do to um, to flex. We have got tough stuff coming down the line at us, all of us globally. We need to flex into that and adapt. And adaptability comes from being soft, from being porous, from being vulnerable, from being open, and being creative. Creativity is killed by comparison, by judgment of ourselves and others, by high levels of perfection. So to respond to what's coming, I think we need to do this flexing. So I'm getting better as I go on, I think. Like, this is my own judgment of st myself. So, um, so just before I, I read the tiny little poem um, by someone else, there's a Chinese proverb that says, fall down seven times, get up eight. And I was thinking, do I believe in that? And I thought, no, do you know what? No, fall down seven times, get up six, and then stay down the seventh time, have a little think, have a cup of tea, <laughs> phone a friend, text your mom. Like, just chill the fuck out, you know what I mean? Like, you do not have to get up that eighth time. Who is, who, who is keeping score about how many times we stand up? 
that is not resilience to me. That is, um, that is societally conditioned strongness. I'm not here for that. And I would tell everybody, I'm, come, come again, don't be out there for that. So, here's a poem. It's by, um, it's by a beautiful poet uh, called Molly Brodak, who did, sadly didn't live very long. But um, I just love it. If anybody, I'm almost reluctant to say follow me on Insta because you could follow me and then unfo take a look and then unfollow me because it's a bit ran it's a random and not great. But um, but I do I do uh, years ago somebody I went to a like a professional development thing and they said what habit are you going to have and I said um, oh I know I'm going to read a poem every day which I do and I did I started and I still do it and occasionally so I read them every day and occasionally something really great will come up and I'll go oh I'll post that so I do post um, and this is one of them. So Molly Brodak, who's an American poet, and she, this is her poem called How Not to Be a Perfectionist. So it's on theme. She says, people are vivid and small and don't live very long. So that's her tip for how not to be a perfectionist. And on that note, I will leave you and say thank you for your attention. Hope it's been helpful. And cheers. Have a great evening. Take care. Oriol Majumna, everyone. Come on, you can do better than that. Oriol Majumna.